And welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming tonight. And um, I, I'm going to, the way this is going to be structured is that I will just do a short introduction to Lena Dingo, who we're really excited is here to speak with us today. And then Lena is going to read to us. We're very lucky that she has written a piece about hope for our Hope Consortium, and it connects to her book, Exhumation, um, The Life and Death of Madame Lal Dingo, which um, we're going to then go into an in conversation about hope and especially about her book and at a certain point um, she may do one or two other readings from this book um, before we'll open it up for questions. So born and having had her early education in India, Lena Dingram moved to Europe after the catastrophe of partition in 1947. She's the author of the novel Amrit Vela 1988 but as I say, Lena is here in York to speak about her biography or memoir or work of narrative nonfiction, Exhumation, The Life and Death of Madame Lal Dingra, which was released in the UK during the pandemic. In a prose poem that ends the volume just before its epilogue, prose, I spent my life in a book I didn't fit into. So this is something I want to ask her about, how she would character, characterize the book and these feelings of not belonging. And she talks about history or his story. That's the story of her great uncle that I'll tell you about shortly. A mystery or my story, her own narrative of her life. And so these two strands interweave in this wonderful book. Lena's family was forced to abandon their home when partition placed Lahore in Pakistan. They went into exile in France, after which Lena came to Britain later on. The big family secret is the execution of Madame Lal Dingra, Lena's great uncle, in London on 17th of August, 1909. An Indian freedom fighter, Madame Lal assassinated the British Indian army officer, William Hutkers and Wiley. In England, Madame Lal is a famous murderer, whereas in India, his head so in, yes, his, uh, so in December 1976, his remains were exhumed and his body returned to India. Defying generic categories, the exhumation, the life and death of Madan Lal Dingra is all about the revealing and of unraveling of secrets, not least about her own identity and sense of belonging. Lena is also an important actor. As well as East is East, East Enders and Ackley Bridge, there is a Doctor Who episode about partition entitled Demons of the Punjab that looms large in exhumation. And Lena may well be kind enough to read her, her Doctor Who chapter to us later. I was sitting in the sunshine earlier today watching this wonderful episode and I really, uh, if you haven't seen it, you must watch it. It's, it's very powerful. After many years um, in London, Lena now lives in the market town of Sandbach in Cheshire. So I'd now like to hand over to Lena, who will read her essay, Imagining Hope, written especially for our Hope Consortium. Lena, thank you. Thank you. Reflections on Imagining Hope in the process of writing my book, Exhumation, The Life and Death of Madan Lal Dingra. Hope matters. Hope is intrinsic to the creative process. This has been a difficult book to write, and after completing it, it had taken and whether it would be of any interest. But after I decided to revisit the manuscript, I met a publisher just before the first lockdown. I had nowhere to go and nothing to do. And so I started my final draft full of hope. It was an unprecedented time. Others too were connected to hope. We were in this together. We put rainbows in our windows, people offered help, masked and gloved on our constitutional walks, we greeted each other, maintaining social distance with a smile. Bird song filled the air. We shared videos, saw goats in Landabno, in the empty streets or feasting on hedges. Leopards and other wildlife roamed city gardens in India. Monkeys swam in deserted swimming pools in posh housing complexes. And we imagined and hoped we might come out the other side with a better set of priorities. Despair, the other side of hope, was also there in the daily death toll and suffering taking place everywhere. But from that too, we hoped to emerge 
more inclusive, compassionate and human, aware of our connectedness and interdependence. The resurgence of Black Lives Matter globally led to a well-attended celebration in my small market town. The book has taken a long time to put together, and during that time, my hope has evolved. I moved from daring to hope to actually understand <laughs> what's happening. Unfortunately, we're being Zoom bombed quite a lot. I think it's because this link went on Twitter, so I'm very sorry, Lena. Please carry on. I'm removing everybody who's okay. misbehaving. Exhumation is part memoir, part history. At the start, I had two traumatic silence and suppressed stories, which I was not sure if I was entitled to, and yet I inherited them. At the heart of both stories was violence. Is that why they were silenced? And was it best they remained untold? In the past, there was a story of my great uncle, Madame Lal Hingra, a young revolutionary who, following his political assassination of Sir Curzon Wiley, was hanged at Pentonville Prison in 1909. His story was silence, my colonial rule, his loyalist family, and even independent India, and its espousal to nonviolence. My own silence story was the partition of India. The cataclysmic event of 1947 took away my parents' homeland, home, security, place in the world, and everything that they had known. They remained marooned in Paris, floating in a bubble of a hope to return. But ill winds, often engineered by family, blew the bubble hither and thither, unable to land. So for me, hope it did not feel like a safe place to go. I inherited traumas and unsettled life, 10 schools in 10 years in four different countries and three languages. This meant that I suppressed or lost my own voice and sense of agency. So from the very beginning, when I thought of undertaking research, I didn't dare to hope. Hope was clouded by fear, self-doubt, and the habit of remaining invisible because of the impact of racism. Did I really want to expose my family's trauma? Why? What did I hope to achieve? Since I could not hear my own voice, I would look for guidance, validation, or a sign hoping that hope might clutter through. When you start to find out about your family history, you start to find out about yourself, I had been told, and this resonated with me. I started my initial research in the public record office and was waiting for documents related to the trial deposition of my great uncle. During that time, I was transported back to family. He's 16 years old and sitting an exam about Jean Anouis Antigone. Was this a sign? And the incident found its way into my book. Back home, I wondered why I had remembered Antigone. Yes, Antigone and her need to bury her brother's body. She had needed to put it to rest properly. She needed to pay it respect. She needed to do this and she did. And I wondered about my own search. What was it I needed to do? Was it for him? Was it for me? I took the photograph of Madame Lau from its envelope, propped it on my desk and alongside it, I played my notebook and my applications for funding. Then I lit a candle and looked at the flames, red, yellow and saffron. My mother would say, saffron is for fire the purifier, the color of renunciation. And mentally I made a request that I should get the funding if it was something I needed to do. When I did receive the funding, I started to imagine hope and that it might guide me. Might restoring Mother La restore me? Might freeing suppressed stories create a healing? Could I steer my parents' bubble to land? Maybe this might be a return from exile. Might I even discover what my deepest hopes might be? I started with validation and optimism, but soon discovered there was no neat path through. It was all a rather messy business and alongside hope was often despair. 
Madan Lal left Amritsar for London with the blessings and hope of his parents. They hoped that their son would wayward and searching son would find his way, become an engineer and take his place in the world, having availed himself of the opportunities open to him. And he did. He was a responsible student, but soon found there were other opportunities. At the time he lived was a time of change, of dissent. Revolution was in the air and dissenters from all over the world were in London, enjoying freedom of speech and assembly in order to meet fellow travelers and prescribe books and share solidarity. He discovered India House, a hostel for Indian students. In the archives today, it says India House, CS for sedition. There he met Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, who was influenced by the cult of Matsini, which espoused political assassinations and hoped to recruit and groom martyrs to the cause of India's freedom. Madanal was filled with hope and a new meaning of merging into the wider history of his time. In court, he declared, I am a patriot working for the emancipation of my motherland. I wish the English people should sentence me to death, for in that case, the vengeance of my countrymen will be all the more keen. I put forward this statement to show the justice of my cause to the outside world, especially our sympathizers in America and Germany. Mother Lal's hope was his family's despair, and his father died of grief at the loss, as he put it, of my ill-fated, ill-guided, but firm and determined son. Many of the issues and personalities in the forefront of the discussions today in India, Gandhi versus Savarkar, violence versus non-violence, were present at that time in India House. In the book, I imagined a scene between Madan Lal and his brother Bhajan Lal, who would later become a Sufi saint. Around a letter which Tolstoy wrote to the Indian revolutionaries called A Letter to an Indian. In this letter, Tolstoy told the revolutionaries that they need to find their own authentic way rather than emulating the violence of their European masters. Gandhi would come upon this letter which would inform Hind Swaraj, his seminal treatise on nonviolence. And in my memoir, Exhumation, my father was organizing an international conference in Venice in 1960, entitled Tolstoy and Gandhi. Savarkar too would later write a seminal book entitled Hindutva. Sorry. Uh, which formed the ideological tract of the Bharatiya Janata Party, the Hindu Nationalist Party in power in India today. Savarkar reportedly inspired and groomed another young man, Naturam Godse, to successfully assassinate Gandhi. In the epilogue to my book, I address Madan Lal thus. In your story, the young Savarkar who was your friend, was just a few months older than you. You met when I mean, you were both 23. You both respected, admired, and had a deep affection for each other. Of that, I have no doubt. You were comrades, fellow revolutionaries, and both dreamed of an India that was free and for the benefit of all its inhabitants. And some of you both shared, struggled to realize, and for which you gave your life. But the Savarkar to whom you are linked on the plinth, whose disciple you are purported to, to be, changed his views, wrote in Lutva, who stigmatized Muslims and advocated unequal citizenship. Would you have given your life for that? I think not. If I extrapolate, you are from the Punjab, the land of the five rivers, which has also been watered and nourished by the rivers of Hinduism, Sikhism, and Islam. You come from Amritsar, home of the great golden temple, whose foundation stone was laid by a Muslim saint. And I would recall that Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism, was revered not only by Sikhs, but by Hindus and Muslims too. 
I might tell you that your fellow patriot from the Punjab and Pensionville, Uddam Singh, quote, while in custody, he called himself Ram Muhammad Singh Azad. The first three words of the name reflect the three major rel religious communities of Punjab, Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh. And the last word, Azad, literally free, reflects his anti-colonial sentiment. In the Punjab today, I am told Muslims are not stigmatized. When the attacks on Muslims took place in Delhi in 2020, the Sikhs rescued them. The Golden Temple issued a hukum nama, an order to save, protect fellow citizens. Food, shelter, support made available. Your plinth declares, I am a Hindu. And I imagine today there must be many people grappling with that question. Years ago, I asked my father, what does it mean for me to be a Hindu? It means you must find and follow your Swadharma, that is to say the path of your true nature, but it must be your way, not mummy's way or my way or anybody else's way, but your own way. The country too will have to find its Swadharma. We live in strange and unsettled times. There is sickness in the body and sickness in the mind, where there are alternative facts and conferences on post-truth. Now, more than ever, hope matters. And as it happens, exhumation was brought out by Hope Road Publishing. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. That's really great. Um, can we start by just talking a little bit about that image of Antigone, the girl wanting to bury her brother's body, but being forbidden that closure. You studied Jean-Henri's version of Sophocles' play when you were at school. And this seems to me a really resonant image for your book, Exhumation, which is all about coming to terms with the past. So please could you give the audience a bit more of a flavor of your quest to find out more about Madame Lal's life and death, and maybe also about the parallels with Antigone. I don't, the thing about Antigone was the bit which came, comes into the book is that when I was, the exam paper that I was replying said, with whom do your sympathies lie? With Crayon or with Antigone? And the way that Anne-Louis had written it or that I had understood it as my 16 year old self, I wrote and said, of course, my sympathies lie with Crayon because it's a much more difficult thing to make compromises, to juggle you know, the possibilities and this, that, and the other. And it's much easier to say, oh no, rebel and go to hell. And there was me sitting in the public record office about to meet the Antigone of my family, who'd been hanged at 25. And I had to weep because there's that kind of certainty of youth that one has and this kind of judgmentalism. And um, so that's where the Antigone story and the Wee's thing comes into my own little journey. And I found it astonishing that I should sit there and that should come. And I find that happens with the creative process. Is it sometimes, and I have quite a lot of that in my book where a line will come or something which somebody said will come. Yeah, that's a great start. Um, Although your book has a lot to say about history from the late 19th century onwards, and especially the 20th century, it also illuminates the present day. Even though the COVID pandemic came afterwards, you talk about your lockdown in your essay. And in the book, you quote resonantly from the Mahabharata when Yudhishthira said, quote, it is that through each of us, though each of us knows that we must die, we behave as though we were immortal. And that really stayed with me in my reading of, of Exhumation. And I feel as though this pandemic has been a global humbling and a reminder of our mortality. So could you talk to us a little bit about the mentions in your essay of COVID and of Black Lives Matter? And 
more than that, maybe what it's been like to bring out a book in a pandemic, because I think your launch was online and you've, you've had to get to grips with Zoom and everything. Well, the thing about bringing out the book, I, I met uh, Pete, my editor, on the 17th of February, and he expressed the fact that the book was interested in the book. And in March started the pandemic. So for me, suddenly there was nowhere to go, nothing to do. And I was just locked up writing the book. So it was a very, for me, a very creative period. It was also very kind of strange because then you're just in this bubble, you're not meeting anybody, you're not talking to anybody much of the past and the traumas and all that. And the online book launch, well, one got that's we got used to that by then, haven't we? We did all these things online and it was a very lovely book launch. So in a way, the fact that I had the book to do protected me from a lot of the, and there's nothing to do in this little town, in any case, <laughs> not a city. So moving to excavation, in India, ideas of violent revolution were displaced in favour of non-violence given Gandhi's influence for so long and one you report one man telling you there has been a falsification of Indian history it is important to counter the image that India was made free by non-violence drinking goat's milk and weaving khadi there are thousands who did not choose the non-violent path and who laid the ground for others. And the official reason in the end for quitting India that Mountbatten gave was that of the naval mutiny. And that was not a nonviolent thing. So I just wanted to ask you, first of all, about, about what's happened to uh, Madan Lal's, um, you know, reputation, people knowing his story in, in that context. And, and then we can come on to talk about the sort of Savaka's legacy and the kind of the Hindu right in recent years, but but first the sort of non-violence versus well, violence debate. I'm not a historian and I don't know that much. So I just mentioned the things which I find on my research. And the person who said that was in Bengal. And because the Bengalis were very much at the forefront of the er early revolutionaries, because in a way it was the partition of Bengal which was the big catalyst. And they weren't nonviolent. And they didn't forget Madan Lal. He was, he features there. If I met quite often the Bengali person and they connected the name, you know, there were certain places which were in this kind of forefront. But I mean that. And then what happened was, when I was doing the research, most of the kind of violent revolutionaries were not um, lauded by the new Congress, sort of the new government, but they were never forgotten. They might not have been, and in a way they were resurrected because they were not forgotten. People remembered them and continue to. In a way, I don't actually know the whole, um, I, I'm a, dis, a dislocated person, but more than that, I'm a deracinated person in some ways. And what I know about things comes from other, you know, external things or people have said or stories I heard or things like that. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, and um, let, let's come on to the more recent group of far from non-violent nationalists in the shape of the BJP and RSS and, and similar, um, which has nonetheless led to further neglect or misrepresentation um, of Madan Lal. 
Um, so you, you were talking to me um, about Savaka and how he was a different person in those early years at India House in London, um, and then later became um, the person who wrote Hindutva and the chauvinist who, who as you said in your piece, um, Madame Lal would not have um, supported that. Um, so I wonder if you could tell, talk a bit more about the book um, and what it does so wonderfully in the way that it pushes back against the Hindu right? Well, it's not so much. It's just the fact that needing to understand the historical context as well. Now, I come from the Punjab. The Punjab was partitioned. So you think that actually a kind of story of animosity might have been part of my heritage, but it wasn't. My mother would say, you know, never in my wildest dreams did I imagine I would leave Lahore or the partition, you know. She said, it wasn't that we lived together tolerating each other. We lived together with so much love. You know, at Diwali, our Muslim friends would send us sweets and gifts wrapped in red. At Eid, we would send them sweets and gifts wrapped in green. And some of our relationships went back generations. How could we imagine that what would happen would happen? We couldn't. So I never grew up or saw any kind of you know, people from Lahore who were Muslims and who happened to be in London, they were friends, they were still part of our lives. So this cutting, this sort of, this kind of assumption that there was a kind of, I, I can't find the word, but that there was an animosity or that there was an other way. It wasn't something that I was familiar with. I didn't hear it. You see, like my mother would, you know, like, yes, maybe, yes, I, I don't really know what to say more, but, and then suddenly this kind of stigmatization and the fact that Madan Lal should be linked to that and people who, and to link to something, I needed to sort of investigate that a bit, understand that a bit. And I felt the need to extricate him because he belonged to another time in history and the India that he died for was our syncretic culture. And given that, um, I want to just read, um, as you know, I'm learning Hindi, so I'm <laughs> eager to try reading this. Um, it's the prayer that they used to say at India House, Ek Dev, Ek Desh, Ek Ek Basha. Ek jat, ek jeev, ek asha. One God, one land, one language, one creed, one life, one hope. And I thought Indrajit in particular would be really interested in that the asha is there at the end. Um, I mean, clearly there isn't ek basha. So in some ways this was, it, this was very idealistic, um, but yeah, this, this kind of oneness and this unity um, is a, a hopeful thing. Um, and allows us to connect the theme of the consortium with your book, which I do think for all its bleak moments is, is a hopeful book. Um, so yeah, I wonder if you could, um, yeah, maybe speak to any angle of that that you like, the India house environment, the prayer itself, or um, all the bigger ideas that, about hope and oneness that it, it raises. Yes, I did feel that whole thing of, you know, Ek Deep, Ek Basha and all slightly problematic because which Basha is it going to be? <laughs> and I also went, I have a little story in my book about going to school in South India, which is a different Basha. 
mm. you know, and culturally it's different. I certainly felt, you know, different to the Punjab and, you know, so everything. So I've lost your question. That's great. Um, I mean, just asking really about hopefulness and oneness and that that sense of India House. I, I think that the, there was that tremendous hope thing in India House. And it was also a time of hope everywhere. It was the time of the suffragette movement. It was things were happening in, in, in Russia. Things, you know, it was just not long after the 1905. There were things happening all over the world. It was a time of change. It was a time of hope. And then all that sort of led up to the First World War. But it was a time of optimism. And it was a time. And this is what fueled or imbued Madan Lal. And in a way, I could recognize this because in the 60s, when I was a teenager, it was also a time of hope, you know. The world, the times they are changing, come writers and artists all over the land, you know, don't criticize what you don't understand, you know, the times they are changing. We listened to Bob Dylan and we also hoped, and we always hoped to make a better, more equitable kind of world, really. And I really like the parallels you draw in the book between briefly drawing parallels between 1968 and that moment of revolutionary hope and, and the 1909 environment of you know, anti-colonial and feminist hope. Um, talking of partition, um, it's, you write, I mean, so incisively and so beautifully about partition and about how it partition keeps happening as it hasn't been dealt with. So you draw parallels with Khalistan in the 1980s, talking about repeating ourselves because we cannot heal and about these unresolved issues. And then you also read that essay by Pankaj Mishra and see parallels with when Brexit happens um, with WH Auden talking about Mount Batten as a master of disaster uh, back in the 40s. Um, and Article 370 more recently and what's have been happening, um, we've already touched on the BJP, but the Kashmir, unresolved issue of Kashmir. Um, so I guess before we go into your reading, and um, we'll talk very shortly about the Doctor Who, and I'd like you to read from that chapter, but could you, could you just talk a little bit about this issue of partition keeps happening because it hasn't been dealt with? Well, that's what it looks like. And certainly, at a personal level, this happened in our family. We kept sort of partitioning. By the time 1960, we were in different continents. My father was in France. My sister was in South America. I was in London. And my mother was between London and Paris and South America and India. And there was never, it was like our life was on quicksand. And it was my sister who said to me that, you know, when a trauma is undigested, it gets repeated. Partition was a terrible trauma and nobody ever talked about it and it got repeated in each of our lives. So from a, and then I would see it happening outside as well. You know, it's like as if it's a sore which hasn't healed. And yes, it was happening in India right from the beginning. Partitions and Khalistan. It just that when I went back to India, I had this sort of hope that something would come together, some fissure would heal, something would come together. And yet when I arrived there, I would just see this incomprehensible political scene, which I had no understanding of. There seemed to be more and more divisions taking place. And interestingly enough, when I started my research was when the BJP, which was a small little party at that time, quite marginal, 
adopted Hindutva as their kind of whatever, you know, you know what I mean, can't think of the word. The ideological almost manifesto. Yeah, yeah their manifesto, the ideological position. And I haven't I didn't didn't even know what that meant. And then this issue was there that Madan Lal was Savarkar was the, you know, my cousin telling me how she met Savarkar and how he touches her feet as a descendant of Madan Lal. You know, he, or he sort of makes obeisance to her all felt a bit overwhelming because of what he represents. And therefore I would ask myself, um, what story am I trying to tell? And where does it sort of align me or put me or? I'm getting very confused by this whole thing, but it's okay. It'll come out all right in the end, will it? Yes, it will. And I wonder, would you be kind enough to read from your prologue where you talk about the Doctor Who episode and about partition? Yes, yes, I will. In the summer of 2018, as a jobbing actress, I took the train to Cardiff to play a role in Doctor Who. Since it's a cult show, its producers are very secretive about content. And so I had not been sent a script. And when I arrived at the hotel, I was given only my two scenes. My part was Nani Umbrim, an elderly Pakistani woman aged around 90, living in Sheffield, having a birthday party with her daughter's family and handing over gifts and mementos to her two granddaughters, through which we learn that the old lady has a story and a secret, something she can't and doesn't want to talk about. Arriving on the set in my big gray wig, I asked what the episode was about. It's about the partition of India. Oh my God, I replied, really? I can't believe it. That's my story, my history, my trauma, my mystery. It's why I'm here. It was also why my character, Nani Umbrin, was in Sheffield. The young director walked across to greet me. Hello, I'm Jamie. Welcome to Doctor Who. He then squatted down beside my chair to be on level with me and said, I never knew about this, about partition, never learned about it in history. And I certainly never knew that we were implicated in any way in this terrible, terrible tragedy. I vaguely raised my shoulders and said, I know I always found it hard when I was growing up here and I would mention partition and no one knew what that was. I'm so, so sorry. I could feel a wave of emotion beginning to well up and immediately sought to diffuse it. And so I said in full theatrical mode, not your fault, darling. You weren't even born. And even if you had it left up to you, you wouldn't have done it like that. Jamie by then was scrolling his phone to show me the various books he had been reading to inform himself while shaking his head and repeating under his breath, it was all too shocking. As he did this, I told him about a character in the satanic verses called Whiskey Siscordia, who stutters for tr 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 trouble with the English. Is it their history happened overseas? And they do, do, do not know what it means. The episode titled Demons of the Punjab by Vinay Patel was aired on the 11th of November, 2018, Remembrance Sunday. The plot involved time travel to Sunday the 17th of August, the day the Radcliffe line demarcating the partition border was announced. It had been arranged that I would watch the episode with my daughter and her family, all great Doctor Who fans who thought it was really, really cool that I was playing a grandmother in one of their favorite TV programs. After it was over, for some reason, I felt impelled to return home. The family was surprised that I didn't stay for a cup of tea and so was I, and I felt a bit bad leaving. Walking home, an incident with my late sister, some 25 years earlier, came to mind. We were having coffee in Polly's tea rooms 
overlooking one of the approaches to Hampstead Heath, when she suddenly said with great intensity, you know, when a trauma is undigested, it gets repeated. It's a known fact. Partition was a terrible trauma and nobody ever talked about it. And it got repeated again and again in mummy's life, in daddy's life, in my life, in your life. We never had a country, a family, a home, a room of our own. Have you ever thought about it? I didn't reply, I just vaguely nodded. That's the trouble with you, Lena. You never know what's going on. You just switch off. You block your feelings and go into denial. The following day, I settled down alone to watch the episode again. As it unfolded, I realized just how much of my own mother I had drawn in the portrayal of my character, her warmth, her humanity, her quirky humor, her knowing looks. When Nani Umbrin says of her life in Sheffield that it gave her a home, a life and stability, I felt happy for her, but so, so sad for my mother, as those were the very things partition took away and that she never managed to restore, a loss and a longing that never lifted. Two weeks before she died, age 99, as I was putting her to bed, she asked, are you taking me back to Lahore? Come on, Mama, I sighed. Don't you remember partition in Pakistan? No, she smiled, but I remember Lahore. Do you remember Lahore? Watching and remembering, I found myself weeping and weeping, weeping from sadness and in joy and pity and peace and release. In the silence of observing came a distancing. That story on the screen was part of me, but I was also a part from it. And as that realization unfolded, identification dissolved and its concomitants, timidity, fear, failure, invisibility, floated away like steam. For the eye altering alters all, as the great poet William Blake wrote. Thank you, Lena. That was beautifully read and beautifully written. So we're, we're starting to get lots of really interesting questions in the chat. So I think I'll start reading some of those. And please, if you have questions, do keep popping them in the chat. Um, I have more questions, but I'm more than happy to give over to the audience. So we'll start with one from Shazwar Salam, who asks, there are several types of movement referred to in your talk, both literal and metaphorical, the forced movement of your family, the movement of your uncle, your own movement across history and present. How significant or central do you think this notion is with, a friend, with reference to finding voice or closure? The movement. Mm. I don't know. I mean, the problem is that sometimes a book sort of happens in an organic kind of a way. And as you write it, it sort of, you follow where it takes you. So I suppose it is important if it's there and it has meaning because it's there, because you do weed things out as well. And then you keep certain things with the help of an editor, of course. <laughs> I don't know if that answers the question. Never feel that you can answer questions properly. I mean, relatedly from me, um, it seems as though you talk about egg being an exile and this, you know, also when you go back to India about being a visitor from foreign is the expression and, and so not really belonging, it's it's hard to feel a sense of belonging in both places. I wonder if that sense of movement also comes from this sort of, this restless feeling of not being at home anywhere. Yes, and also, you see, there are two things. One is, in my kind of world with my parents and my family, there is this world of stories, of values. You know, my mother often says, Always remember we are refugees. 
Everything we had was lost in the partition. Everything we now have is by God's grace. And therefore you must remember to share your good fortune with those less fortunate than you. Then there is, in the stories, there's exile. Ram and Lakshman are exiled to the forest. The brothers in the Mahabharata are also exiled. And there's always this thing that they've got to, the, the, these heroic journeys of things that they have to do, and at the end of it, they'll be able to be a homecoming. So the hope for me or for my family was always that there would be this homecoming. And then the reality was, yes, I'm in France. I speak French. The earliest nursery rhymes I know are French ones. I didn't know any English ones. You know, I knew a few Hindi ones, but they're the French ones. And then I come to England where I'm a, ex, from a colonial invisible history. And I go to India where people regard me as coming from elsewhere, from being, we have, they project another kind of reality onto me, you know, you know, Paris, London, you know, some kind of something else. Um, and then my own personal feeling is one of a bit of despair, of dislocation, of rejection, of being outsider everywhere. And there's not very many safe places that you can express that until I found the safe place of being a writer. And even that was quite hard and very difficult for me to allow my own voice. So when you said to me about my writerly voice, I thought, really? Gosh. And not only me, but also in the chat, you have Shazra has said, you know, she agrees it's beautifully written. Um, your, your voice is wonderful, um, both your spoken voice and your writerly voice. Um, I think I'm going to jump to a question from Minal because that fits with what you were just talking about. She says, one country, one language, one hope can never be the truth for India. So how else do we go about loving and representing a homeland that is, as Benedict Anderson puts it, an imaginary homeland? So how can we have a positive imagining of home when it is so diverse without doing the sort of simplification that that prayer does? Well, I don't know. You see, for instance, when I, the India that I went back to, to my school in South India in Rishi Valley, it was real. It had all that idealism because there is a kind of, cultural coercion. There is something about, let's call it the Indian civilization, which is absorbing and it's there. Things have happened in between. I don't really know, I haven't been part of them. But it's difficult because they had that vision for Europe as well, didn't they? that would be a European kind of a thing and then the fishers come. Mm -hmm. So in India, we had this like, all the corners of India are supposed, they're all connected. You know, there might be different languages, there might be different things, but there's something in the culture which is kind of like there. And Every, everything I would feel is affected by this. What's happened here? Nothing, I don't think. Don't worry. Um, yes, and also in the chat, Erin has sort of more of a comment than a question, but your, like your Europe point, she says, um, from, from South Carolina, she says, we in the United States have a similar conundrum. How is unity possible given our great diversity, diversity which sometimes causes, incre causes incredible tension? Mm. And then, well, from, we again, oh, sorry. Well, it comes back to hope, isn't it? We have mm. to cling to the 
to the hope that, you know, within all that, we're human beings primarily, first and foremost. We all end up as a bunch of a bit of dust somewhere, you know? And sort of sticking with this, uh, a similar idea, I think this is probably a bit more of a question because the comment was mine, it, but um, Patty says, interesting you say that about the humbling, deeply humanizing effects of the pandemic. I've often thought that, but also that much of the anger and resistance to public health message in some quarters has actually stemmed from deep, unfortunate resistance to acknowledging the same, to an to connect it to this book, one can't have true hope if one resists having any human need for it. And that's it's a similar point to the one you were just making about humanity. Mm. But yeah, I think um, that's a really good point off the back of what I said about a global humbling. And there I'm actually quoting Zadie Smith from her collection of essays, uh, Intimations, she talks about the global humbling. Um, that, Yes, I, I agree that I think um, that there's a lot of resistance to that idea and that that's part of the reason for the for the extra divisions we see at the moment. Then Lena, we have a question, another question from Shazra who says, when, where or why do you think that the nationalism which motivated your uncle transmuted into the nationalist ideology of Hindutva? Or is it that given the very tendency of homogenization embedded within nationalism and thereby the violence it unleashes on the other, any form of nationalism is ultimately bound to fail? Is it more of a disillusionment than mirage than a true hope? Complicated question. Mm, good question. But do yeah, I don't know. I mean, the thing is that I have looked at this and wondered of that journey. Did something happen to this man when he was in the Andaman Islands, which sort of changed his mind? But a friend of mine said to me that this kind of And I don't know about this, but we have a very hierarchical situation in Hinduism, don't we? And we have one group which looks down on another and can do this. And, and maybe that's a problem that we need to deal with properly and it's never, that's never been dealt with. I have no idea, but I did try to understand I mean, there was nothing about the young Sabarka that I could see. He was a revolutionary. He had a secular vision of India. What happened? But some people would say, well, the seeds of going in, that other way of stigmatization and all is there within this kind of Brahminical culture that, that I'm not familiar with it, but this is the feedback that I've received when I've tried to sort of say, this is what I'm trying to understand. And they say this kind of coldness and this sort of a certain kind of attitude is there. What that is, I don't know, because I don't, it's complicated for me. And that's why, in a way, with the book, it's me trying to understand. I don't have the answers to the question. I'm trying to find them. And that's why I ended up by saying, you know, I feel as though I've been part of a story which I don't know anything about, but I'm going to, I've told it as best I can, and I'm going to walk out of it and find my own inner story. Because all my life I've tried to belong to something which is what I've been trying to belong to. The idealist India that my parents told me about, the Gandhi and India, the, of where well, you care, you know, where you're a refugee and you care about other people. My mother would walk with Vinoba Bhave 
in the ground land movement where people would give land, people would give bulan, you know, the people, landowners would give land for the landless. And all this kind of a thing where there was the business of finding who are we, what is Indian civilization? And that's what I grew up with and saw around me, but where did I see it around me? In Paris. You know, then I would go to a Krishnamurti school in South India, and that would be all there as well. Then I, when I came back to do the research, I mean, I would say, well, what is going on here? And where is, where do I fit into this? I don't. So I walk out of the story in the end. to try and find, you know, what my father said, find the part of your true nature. It's not easy to do. We have another question um, about the gender dimension um, of the whole process. It's interesting to see you being a woman, look to write about your uncle about as a way of finding your voice or cre creating a sense of belonging. Could you talk a bit more about your experience as a woman writing about politics, history, and was there any conflict? Well, I'm an actor. And that's one of the things you learn in the process of drama school and acting is you know a director will say think about so it is a man and it is a young man and you have to use your imagination to inhabit that space and you do that by seeing what other young men of that kind kind of like do, and you know people and you try and imagine it. So I don't know whether what it does. I mean, I did my best. So for instance, how to get into the mind of a young revolutionary, where there are people who've written books about the Bengal revolutionaries and how they think and this stuff. So you, you sort of do it in that kind of a way. It was interesting because I had great difficulty in dealing with aspects of violence that were there. I couldn't go there. Some things didn't happen in my imagination. And so I had to find other ways to express them or to hand them over to the reader. So I would stand back and do it through the documents in the trial deposition where other people who were present at the time are describing the violence. But I couldn't go, you know, so there are, yes, so that would answer part of the question is that yes, there were things which either I couldn't imaginatively or I didn't want to imaginatively enter. Thank you, Lena. Are there any further questions? If you are also welcome to unmute yourself, turn video on and ask Lena a direct question if that's easier or in the chat. So we've got a comment from Patty. I think it's a comment, uh, but it, she says, so appreciate your willingness to explore what are manifestations. Oh, sorry, I've scrolled down too far. Uh, what are manifestations of ex eternal questions in the human conundrum embracing the constantly shifting approximation of answers. I was just in a deep discussion yesterday, and again, I've lost a little bit, um, about the a lifelong thing about hierarchical influences on human life when in our lives we've consciously resisted them, when we haven't been capable of recognizing them in the moment of our lives. And uh, again, I wanna jump down. Um, can you read it? Yes. <laughs> Lena, sorry, I've lost. 
when we haven't been capable of recognizing them in the moments of our lives and what it means to be able to resist or not. Yeah. I, <coughs> yeah. I mean, these hierarchical things are there. In my journey, one of the things that I found was that in a way, we were just not, we were displaced. We were dislocated, whatever it was. You were also déclassé. And I would certainly feel that when I would be in India, which is very hierarchical. Who am I? Who am I connected to? And I'm very well connected. But that's there. Me personally, I have no connections. You see what I mean? I don't have a connection myself within that hierarchy. And I would feel it. <coughs> so I don't know quite. It's a little bit I understand this question. But I haven't got the answers. <coughs> oh, dear. Mm -hmm. Well, we maybe should give your voice a rest. You've done a lot of reading for us and it's been really wonderful. So unless other people have any questions, um, I'm conscious that we have gone past seven o'clock. So last minute questions, you're welcome to put in the chat. Otherwise, I really want to thank you, Lena, for a really stimulating and wonderful talk. Apologize again for it was a mistake to put the um, link on Twitter and have the disturbance early on, but um, you handled it extremely well. And it's been so interesting. I really enjoyed this and all the comments in the chat. And there's a lot of positive feedback, which I will send you through. <coughs> so, Sorry. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. And thank you all for being there. And I hope this was interesting. It was so interesting. And it was a pleasure to read your wonderful book. And I really encourage everybody to go out and get it from Hope Road or Amazon, but ideally hope for it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Claire. Thank you, Lena. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs>